Okay, hello and welcome everyone. So in this video, I'm gonna go over some notes in review for a macroeconomic principles final exam. So basically what I'm gonna do is go over kind of the list of thoughts that I have personally before writing a final exam for principles of macroeconomics. And so, you know, useful certainly for my own students, but then actually probably useful more generally if you're taking a macroeconomics uh, principles level class or interested in learning more about macroeconomics, I suppose, in terms of just thinking about a nice sort of semester overview. Anyway, so the key idea behind economics is kind of dealing with scarcity. We have to deal with scarcity at an individual level, at a household level, firm level, at the government or society level. Right. And so there's a lot of different ways to organize activity in an economy. There's a market based economy. There's a command and control based economy. And basically all of these different things are trying to answer the questions of what's going to be produced. How are we going to produce it? And then who is going to receive what has been produced? Right. And the different economic systems have different ways of answering those questions. But basically the motivation behind all of them is scarcity. That's the central problem in economics. That's the central motivation motivation for studying economics. A uh, good definition of economics, economics is the study of how people attempt to satisfy their unlimited wants with scarce limited resources. In terms of allocation and in terms of deciding what to produce, how to produce it, the market system is the clear best in terms of efficiency. So market systems are the best way to maximize total productivity, it leads to the efficient allocation of resources, both in terms of who's doing the production and then who's receiving what's been produced. And, you know, there's other economic systems at, you know, in the world and in the U.S. economy, in fact, during the war years, there was a command aspect to the, with rationing to the U.S. economy. And so can't even say that the U.S. economy has always been capitalistic and, mar and market based. That's certainly always been the foundation and the backbone of the economy. But there's been periods such as during the wars, World War One, World War Two, where a command and control system prevailed because the economy was trying to mobilize resources for the war effort. Anyway, so. Uh, even apart from that, we can argue about whether economic efficiency is the best way to judge an economic system, but there's no question that the market-based system maximizes efficiency. And so it's the best way to stretch resources the furthest and to raise standard of living the highest on average. Now, of course, we might have other sort of competing ideas, might have other competing goals, but if our criteria is maximizing efficiency and making people on average as best off as possible, there's no comparison for there's no there's no other alternative besides uh, sort of a market or mixed market system. OK, so in terms of the distinction between microeconomics and macroeconomics. Microeconomics focuses on the individual product or service markets. So we're thinking about a single product or a single service, or we're thinking about a single decision or series of decisions made by one kind of decision maker entity. So it could be an individual, it could be a household, it could be a firm. That's contrasted with macroeconomics, which is focusing on the economy as a whole. So the central model in microeconomics is a supply and demand model. And if we're just drawing out like literally the graph for supply and demand, the vertical axis is the price of that good. The horizontal axis is the quantity of that good. And then we've got your ordinary demand, ordinary supply curve, and so on and so forth. Now, if we're talking about the macroeconomics model, the central model is based on the supply and demand model. So we introduce the supply and demand model first, like early on in the semester talking about macroeconomics. But ultimately, we, we focus on developing the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. And that focuses on the economy as a whole, not just a single product, not just a single service, but all of them together. So therefore, the vertical axis still captures prices, but it's actually going to be the price level as captured by some price index, usually the consumer price index, but it could be the producer price index. It could be the GDP deflator. There's a variety of other kind of variants of the consumer price index and the producer price index and the whole, whole variety. But the basic idea is we're capturing something about the general prevailing price level in the economy with the vertical axis of the aggregate demand, aggregate supply curve. The horizontal axis still captures output. Typically, it's represented by real GDP. So we want some measure of output. We need real GDP as contrasted from nominal GDP because real GDP is inflation adjusted. It's separating out all the variation that might happen through time uh, coming through the 
coming through money, coming through the price level, and it's focusing just on changes in the actual output produced. So that's why we always wanna work with real variables when we're making across year comparisons. Okay, so the basics of supply and demand. This is sort of important foundations, thinking about the supply and demand model. And then we take a lot of the intuition forward for aggregate demand, aggregate supply. So the demand curve itself, it's a collection of the set of plans of consumers. So it gives us for each possible price, a quantity demanded. Then the law of demand says at higher prices, there's a lower quantity demanded and at lower prices, there's a higher quantity demanded. So basically it's like high prices, consumers lose interest, low prices, consumers are really excited about buying. And so that's explaining the quantity demanded rising or falling according to how price changes. You wanna think of quantity demanded as the amount consumers are willing, able to buy at a given price at a specific price. Now, from any initial price, if the price rises, quantity demanded falls. If the price falls, quantity demanded rises. And that's just the dynamics of the law of demand. Above this, we could talk about elasticity, which tells us something about the responsiveness. So we know price is changing, we know which direction quantity is moving, but then the question is, and what elasticity answers, and talk about this in other videos, is like how sensitive, how responsive? Do we get a small price change and a big quantity response? Then we have elastic or responsive demand, or maybe we get a really large price change and almost no change in quantity demand. It's still gonna change, but maybe it's very small. That would be inelastic or unresponsive demand. Anyway, when prices change, only the quantity demanded can change. So this catches a lot of students and across a lot of exam questions. You get some type of change, some type of shock to the market. If you can identify it as a price change of that good or service in that particular market and time period we're talking about, nothing else can change besides quantity. So consumers aren't changing their plans when prices change, they're just following them. They're enacting their plans and they're looking to see, okay, at this price, I buy this quantity. At this other price, I buy this other quantity. So if the price changes, the quantity that I'm gonna buy changes. So change in price causes a change in quantity demanded. We represent changes in quantity demanded with a movement along a single demand curve. So we're still on the same demand curve. We still have the same set of plans. We're just moving from point to point on it if prices change. Now, in order to get a change in demand, a shift, we have to have something other than price changing. So if demand increases, we represent that with a rightward shift. If demand decreases, that's a leftward shift. And we've got a collection of recognizable demand shifters. Now, I want you to realize these are all just like the way to kind of like, it's really helpful answering exam questions if you recognize specific demand shifters, but really to be able to get the question like, Nine times out of 10 to be able to get it correctly, just kind of pull a random statistic. It's, has price changed? If so, then only quantity can change. Has something other than price changed? If so, then demand can shift, right? So our demand shifters are the number of buyers, consumer incomes, consumer tastes and preferences, prices of related goods, and changes in expected future prices. Now, let me elaborate a little bit more here. An increase in income will cause an increase in demand for a normal good but a decrease in demand for an inferior good. A normal good is one where when your income rises, you buy more. An inferior good is one where when your income rises, you buy less. For prices of related goods, this matters are the goods complements or substitutes. If the goods are complements and the price of the complement rises, you'll buy, there'll be a, a decrease in quantity demanded of the complement and a decrease in demand of the good under consideration. If the related good is a substitute and the price rises, you buy less of that one, so quantity demanded falls of the good with the price rise always, but then if they're substitutes, then we'll buy more of the good under consideration. And I've got a, I've got a separate video that maybe I'll try to remember to link these up that talks about, and it does this with graphs. I just kind of want to call attention to that here. Uh, changes in expected future prices. This can be tricky because I just told you if price changes, only quantity changes. Well, the, the one sort of caveat is you have to think about is the, ch is the change in price in the future? If so, then what's changed isn't the price, it's the belief about what'll happen in the future. And so in the immediate period, if I believe the future prices are gonna change, there's no change today, it's just that my belief has changed and my belief is gonna be a demand shifter, just like consumer tastes and preferences are fundamentally beliefs and also a demand shifter. Okay, so for the supply curve, supply is a collection of the set of plans, but now of sellers. For each possible price, there's a quantity supplied. And then by the law of supply, at higher prices, there's a higher quantity supplied. Lower prices, there's a lower quantity supplied. I always say something like, at higher prices, 
sellers are more interested in operating in the market and at lower prices, they kind of lose interest. And really what's happening is at higher prices, there's more firms that are able to bring the amount of the good to the market based on if the price exceeds their cost of production or not. If the price falls, there's too many sellers where it, it just becomes uh, no longer cost effective to surge, surf the, surf, serve the market. And so we expect the quantity of supply to fall when prices fall. Okay, so we represent changes to the quantity supplied with a movement along a single supply curve. Just like buyers, if the price changes, sellers aren't changing their plans, they're just following them. They're just saying, okay, well, at this price, am I covering my costs? If so, then I supply, I bring some amounts of the good to the market. If not, then I don't operate or I just bring less or whatever so that I'm not losing money. Uh, if supply increases, that's a, light, that's a rightward shift. If supply decreases, that's a leftward shift, and again, in order to get a shift, we need something other than price to change. So it could be like changing the number of sellers, uh, changing the price of important inputs, change in production technology, changes in the prices of related goods the firm could produce, <laughs> changes in expected future prices. So let me talk about these a little bit. Uh, change in the related products the good could produce or the, the firm could produce. Think about like Apple. Apple, can, Apple computers can produce the iPhone, iPad, and iPod essentially all with this it's like the same thing really for all practical purposes it's like three devices that are identical and they just market them differently there are some variations but for all practical purposes it's the same thing suppose the price of iphones rises what's apple going to do well apple's going to decrease its supply of ipads right the price of iphones rises apple increases the quantity supplied of iphones right if price changes only the quantity can change so the price of iphones rises the quantity supplied of iphones rises but what a, so relative to the related good the firm could produce relative to ipads iphone is a substitute in production and now what's going to happen is apple's going to decrease their supply of iPads because they're going to take those materials and put them into increasing their quantity supplied of iPhones, right? That's that's how that works. And again, the video I mentioned, I'll try to link up, does pictures for this as well. Uh, changes in expected future prices. You could think of this with something storable like oil. So like if we believe like oil prices are going to be higher in the future, maybe we should stockpile now and then sell the oil in the future. And then so you'd get if we expect the prices are higher in the future, then we'd reduce, we get a decrease in supply today. Uh, and then we get when prices actually rise in the future, then it's an increase in quantity supplied. Okay, so if demand increases, we can expect price and quantity to rise. So now we're thinking about like what can happen in terms of like one of the questions we're really interested in is like what happens to the equilibrium? What happens to the equilibrium price and quantity? So here, like you could do this graphically. Actually, you should probably stop the video and like you should always like get a piece of paper and like draw this out with graphs. I've got other videos that do that. Here, I just want to think about what if you can't draw the graph? Like what if you don't? However is your exam or however, what it, maybe you can't draw the picture and you need to think through it. Well, here's the conceptual argument for the, for the comparative static. So if demand increases, we expect price and quantity to rise in equilibrium. You can think of consumers competing the price up, right? If demand increases, increase the number of buyers, buyers are really excited about whatever this is, they compete with each other to drive the price up. If demand decreases, price and quantity both fall, you can just think of consumers losing interest. So consumers just kind of leave the market and then the price and quantity both fall. Um, so if supply increases, we expect the price to fall and quantity to rise. So this is like a rightward shift to the supply curve. You can think of like the firm flooding the market, right? If we flood the market, it's just like abundance. And so we expect price has to fall to be able to sell those units because they're so plentiful, but then more are gonna be sold. So the quantity, the equilibrium quantity is higher. Okay, so if supply decreases, we expect price to rise and quantity to fall. You can think of like increasing scarcity in the market, like what happens when uh, with like a pipe, pipeline ruptures or there's a attack or there's like a refinery that's out or whatever is the case. Now all of a sudden you've got less being produced. There's going to be a smaller quantity, of course, and then whatever is that quantity that's there, buyers are going to have to compete with each other. Price goes up, right? So leftward shift of supply is going to give us a higher price, lower quantity. Now, if both curves move, we actually need to consider all the alter alternatives. I like telling students when we have like shocks in the market, we have like a demand supply shifter, you want to think of like one cause and one effect. So you identify the change as affecting either supply or demand, you shift the curve and that's the end of it, 
right? And so if we have a situation where there's like a disruption in the oil refinery, so there's less oil being produced, we'd expect a leftward shift to the supply curve for oil. That is going to be the end of it. We don't want to talk about demand shifting or anything like that. We're just going to stop one cause, one effect, curve shifts to the left. That's the end of it. Technically, if we have a leftward shift in the supply of oil, yes, that drives up the price. What's the demand effect? Decrease in quantity demanded right? If you have a leftward shift to supply, a decrease in supply raises the price, lowers the quantity in equilibrium, but at the higher price, we're expecting a lower quantity demanded. So, and then if you get an increase in demand, if you have an increase in demand, a rightward shift to demand, that's going to tend towards price and quantity both rising relative to supply, one cause, one effect. We're not going to shift the supply curve. We just say because of the higher price, we'll get a higher quantity supplied. Right? So that's important to just kind of tying things together. But I think just the, the least confusing way to do it is just if you have a shock to the market, identify it as either shifting demand or supply, shift that curve and then be done with it. Kind of move on to like whatever else is being told in the particular example. Do you have another curve shifting or not? Like don't try to kind of complete the circle or, or mix up all the rest of the dynamics that can have happen afterwards. Just talk about what happens when that one curve shifts in the direction you've been told. That's it. Okay, so um, now if both curves move, we actually need to consider all the alternatives. Supply and demand effect will agree for either price or quantity and will disagree for the other. So the effect on price or quantity is known for sure, and the effect on the other one is ambiguous or indeterminate. I recommend drawing two pictures, one where demand has a larger magnitude shift and one where supply does. The reason why is because, so just consider a situation where we have like a decrease in demand and a decrease in supply. Decrease in demand, decrease in supply. That's a leftward shift of demand, leftward shift of supply. The decrease in demand, we already talked about that causing, think of, interpreted as buyers losing interest. Price falls, quantity falls. The leftward shift to supply, the decrease in supply, we think of this as increasing scarcity. Quantity falls, price rises, right? So the decrease in supply tends towards price rising. The decrease in demand tends towards price falling. They disagree for price, they agree for quantity. That's what I mean here when I say that either price or quantity is known for sure and the other one is indeterminate. Now, if you draw two pictures, draw one where you shift supply a little bit further to the left, then you're shifting demand, price will rise in the new equilibrium, and draw another picture where you're shifting demand a little bit further to the left, then you're shifting supply price will fall in equilibrium. I've got another video where I talk about how economists actually use a supply and demand model and something like using the supply and demand model in practice or whatever. And it's basically that given that we know if both curves shift, there's this ambiguous effect on, on one variable. We know for sure the other one happens. What we can do if we collect empirical data is we can see, oh, wow, if, if we know for sure there's been a decrease in demand and there's been a decrease in supply, but we see the price has risen, in real life, then we know what's happened is even if demand is shifting to the left, supply has shifted further to the left because the prevailing effect must be that price rises. That's associated with the leftward shift to supply, not the leftward shift to demand. It must be that supply is swamping the effect on demand. That's how you'd actually use the model. Like, <laughs> that very often gets left out. I mean, I don't know, understand why my colleagues in, in, in general don't like across the discipline, don't like make a bigger deal of that. But that, that's actually like how you would use the supply and demand model. But anyway, so, uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, right. So for the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model, um, things work similarly. The aggregate demand shifters are changes in consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. So if you get a change in one of those things, then you'll get a leftward or a rightward shift in the aggregate demand curve, right? So usually like what you could have, what you could have happening is suppose there's a recession, people get worried about the recession, they start saving their money, consumption falls, consumption is the largest component of aggregate demand and GDP, and so aggregate demand is shifting to the left. Right. Or we have like the government expanding uh, spending due to like trying to respond with a stimulus package. That's going to be an increase in government spending. That's going to increase aggregate demand and shift aggregate demand to the right. For aggregate supply, it's basically things that affect production and business in the entire industry. So this would be something like 
um, like prevailing wages, or this would be like technology, something like um, regulation, environmental regulations, you know, prices of an input that affects like all production, like maybe oil or something like that. I don't know. It's basically things that affect production and business in the entire, actually, I shouldn't have said an industry. I should have said entire economy, actually, because we're talking about the aggregate supply model. All right, if aggregate demand is stationary and aggregate supply shifts to the left, the price level rises and output falls. It's just the same logic as a leftward shift to supply in the supply and demand model, right? We get a higher price, we get a lower quantity. But it's got a different interpretation because our vertical axis is price level. So if we got price level rising, that's inflation. If we have the quantity falling, that's output, that's output falling as a recession. And then if less output's being produced, fewer workers and machines are necessary to produce that output. So we have unemployment rising. And we always want to think of unemployment as being both human and then also like productive resources like capital and stuff like this, because when there's unemployment, yes, it's really bad for people, but it also means that there's like idle cap, it's like capital, it's not being used either. Okay, so, um, and then that is relevant for then the expansion, because if you then want to use those machines and be able to ramp up production, you can typically hire them back at a, at a lower price. All right, sorry. So um, the price level, the price increase in the price level is interpreted as inflation. We would call this cost push inflation if we have aggregate supply shifting to the left. That's cost push inflation. It's basically associated with the situation where the economy is producing less than it possibly could be. So it's like inside its production possibilities frontier and it's doing it at higher cost, which is bad. So, all right, if the aggregate supply curve is stationary and aggregate demand shifts to the right, then as the price level, then, okay, and aggregate demand shifts to the right, price level rises, output rises, unemployment falls, right? Just like if, if regular demand shifts to the right, we get a higher price, higher quantity. This is like consumers competing up the price. Well, in the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, here we have like an increase in the price level, so that's inflation. We have an increase in output, and to be able to produce that additional output, we need more workers. And so we expect unemployment to fall, both of people and then also productive capital, like factories and whatever are gonna be maxed out as well as we're trying to ramp up production. Okay, so the increase in price level here, again, interpreted as inflation, and this is called demand pull inflation. It's basically when there's too much money chasing too few goods. Like that's the term that's associated with this situation. An increase in nominal GDP increases the demand for money because more money is needed to facilitate the larger volume of transactions. So it, as we're getting an increase in aggregate demand, It'll cross the aggregate supply at a further to the right place. That's going to give us an increase in GDP. If we have an increase in nominal GDP, this will increase the demand for money because more money is necessary to be able to make those transactions happen. So here I've been talking about inflation. I want to clarify this and make a distinction between regular inflation and hyperinflation. So what I've been talking about so far is just like ordinary inflation. Hyperinflation is its whole own thing. So it's a completely different animal entirely is what I said. The U.S. has not experienced hyperinflation. It's a circumstance where money essentially becomes essentially worthless. I don't know. Maybe somebody is going to take issue with this and say like in like really, really long. I don't know. Whatever. So for all practical purposes in the modern era, the U.S. has not experienced hyperinflation. Um, so this would be a circumstance where money becomes essentially worthless. So we're talking about like inflation rates of well over, it's usually like a thousand or a million percent. It's like ridiculous, right? So um, that's not what, that's not what's like happening here. We're talking about a situation where like printing money, like having, like actually making the currency makes the physical material worth less by virtue of having put that currency insignia on it, right? You take a piece of paper, it's like cotton based or whatever in the US, whatever is the case, I don't know, put the ink on it, you make it into a dollar and now it's decreased in value because it's worth less as a dollar than it would have been to draw a picture on it or something, right? Write a note on it. So that would be the situation with hyperinflation. So hyperinflation, very, very, very bad. So super disruptive for economy. It's just like, it's probably in terms of like things that can go wrong with money, that's the worst that can happen, right? Um, that doesn't, that's not happened in the U S. Um, and we've had like relatively high inflation rates. So like even like 1970, 1980, we're compared to, we're high inflation by historical standards for the U S but even that wasn't hyperinflation. So hyperinflation is just like out of control, runaway inflation. And so that's typically happened in, 
uh, developing countries or countries with a less stable economic system. Actually, kind of the, the prescription to get out of hyperinflation is to um, kind of <laughs> revamp the entire system, maybe adopt a gold standard or something like that. Gold standard, not a good idea for a developed global economy um, because it constricts growth. However, if you have other types of problems going on in the economy, then maybe that trade-off is warranted. So that'd be useful maybe for maybe for a developing country. Okay, so, all right, sometimes we use real GDP per capita as a measure of well-being in the economy. That's just the real GDP develop, or divided by the population. So one of the problems in developing countries is that the population growth is too rapid relative to economic growth, relative to real GDP. Think about what's happening. GDP per capita is like a rough measure of the average standard of living. The numerator is real GDP. The denominator is the population, just dividing the output by the population and on the assumption we're evenly distributing everything throughout the economy. Of course, that's a terrible assumption because there's like inequality everywhere. But if we were just trying to get a measure that we could go across countries, we could use real GDP per capita. And then it's going to be a better or worse measure depending on the level of inequality in the economy. Okay, so whatever. How do you make real GDP bigger? Well, you could increase GDP or you could decrease the population, like ceteris paribus, other things equal. Okay, so we're not decreasing the population, but maybe we decrease the rate of population growth relative to the growth of the size of the economy. And that's a formula for economic growth. That's actually the prescription that's going to be necessary for a lot of developing countries. Either that or just like phenomenally ramping up the productivity. Productivity is the way, like increases in productivity is the key way to raise standard of livings uh, in economies. Okay, so uh, in order to get an increase in real GDP per capita, you either need an increase in real GDP or a decrease in the population or both, right? Okay, so fiscal policy is the domain of the federal government. It doesn't have anything to do with money, even though like fiscal, so like tip, fiscal responsibility has to do with money. No, fiscal policy is the domain of the federal government. It's government spending and taxes, right? Doesn't have anything to do with money. Monetary policy is the purview of the Federal Reserve and has everything to do with money. The Federal Reserve, it's a quasi-public institution for all practical purposes. The Federal Reserve is a private entity relative to the U.S. government. It's definitely not a branch of the U.S. government. It's not part of the cabinet. It's completely separate, right? So that's the, that's the Federal Reserve. Now, actually, I have a video on the Federal Reserve. It's interesting to go into the Fed uh, structure and to kind of learn about it. You can go to Google. You can type up um, like uh, U.S. Federal Reserve District Map or whatever. And hopefully you come to the Fed page and you can click on the map or just find my video and I show you how to do this. And you can learn about your district and you can click on it. You can find who's the president of the local Fed, like, you know, who's the president at whichever. And then who are the additional, what's the additional leadership? And you'll notice that the additional directors, it's not, you might just think the Fed is just like all bankers. No, no, there's representation from the regionally important industry. So in California, there's a lot of like movie industry, a lot of tech that's has that has representation in the San Francisco Fed. You know, in uh, in Michigan, you've got a lot of representation from the auto industry. Right. And so in um, I think in Atlanta, they had representation from Coca-Cola. Right. So think, think about like all the important think about like all the important regionally important um industries and you'll see that reflected in the leadership of the federal reserve and the, the idea that the federal reserve is decentralized it's distinctly american it's the third incarnation of the federal reserve in the u.s is the present one you know since 1914 right and the idea is to be able to have a sort of balance of power within industries within the fed so anyway so learn more about the fed it's kind of less kind of I don't know, nebulous and scary once you kind of learn about what, what it's all about. And it's not just a bunch of bankers. It's got, you know, there's a whole bunch of, um, there's a whole bunch of intent behind like whose interests are being represented and reflected and served by the policies of the Fed. Anyway, so, um, all right. So relative to money, money has three key features. It's a medium of exchange, it's a store of value, and it's a unit of account. The medium of exchange function simply means you can pay with money. People are going to accept it in exchange for goods and services. The store of value means it's retaining its value through time. Like you can keep your value that you've accrued in this asset, money, and then whatever, if it's serving as money, then it, you're going to approximately have about the same amount in the future as you did when you saved it in that form. So 
moderate inflation, inflation aside. All right. So for instance, relative to the store of value to give kind of a kind of a clever example, lettuce would be a terrible type of money. It's not a very good store of value. It's perishable right? It mold, it spoils, it goes bad. It'd be a pretty terrible medium of exchange too, because you're not going to actually, like people talk about money's lettuce, but you're actually not going to be able to pay for anything with lettuce because nobody's going to accept it as a medium of exchange. And it's pretty bad as a unit of account too, because a unit of account means that you can measure values across like commodities and, and goods and services in this but relative to the same um, on the same scale. And so you'd have to denominate all, all prices in terms of lettuce, which would be ridiculous. Okay, so um, did I have this on? Yeah, asset. Okay, so uh, the uh, right. So unit of yeah, unit of account is being able to it's like the measuring stick value of money. Okay, so uh, Lettuce would be a terrible type of money because it's not a good store of value. This pertains to the asset demand for money. The asset demand for money is basically people wanting to hold money as a store of value that they've accrued. Not a good idea if there's substantial inflation, but just fine if there's like low to moderate inflation. The asset demand therefore varies inversely with the interest rate, right? The interest rate essentially is like your 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 payment for um, for loaning for making loans, and so uh, and it's associated with like the incentive to save. So if you have if you have um, if you have a relatively low interest rate, now you have all of a sudden not as much of an incentive to save because um, the the value that's being accrued through time is smaller. And so um, anyway, so all right, when interest rates rise, people seek better vehicles of investment than just holding money, right? So at higher interest rates, then um, then also people <laughs> want to find better, better, um, better vehicles of investments, but at higher interest rates, there's a better, um, there's a larger incentive to save. Okay. Unit of account means you can compare prices. Rel there's just like the relative values of goods. I knew I had unit of account here somewhere. There it is at the very end. Good. All right. Expansionary fiscal policy has the goal of expanding real GDP. It's enacted by increasing government spending and or reducing taxes. So we see like in response to a recession, a stimulus package, that's an example of expansionary fiscal policy. It's increasing government spending. Sometimes there's reduced taxes associated with it. Uh, so, all right, there's a crowding out effect and there's a multiplier effect associated with fiscal policy. The crowding out effect is basically if the government runs deficits, it's borrowing and exhausting the supply of available funds to borrow, right? There's only so many savers and there's only so much money being saved in the economy that can then be loaned out. If the government's borrowing a large amount to be able to finance a stimulus package, all right, now we've got a little bit of a problem because it makes it more difficult for other people to be able to borrow. So that's going to drive up interest rates, makes it makes less prospective business projects likely to be profitable. And so you're going to get less and less business investment, right? Uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. All right. So there's decreased economic activity as a result relative to the situation without crowding out. So it's like if the government spends a dollar, it generates something like 80 cents worth of economic activity. Now, I want to kind of be careful with how I'm saying this. It's like if you have expansionary fiscal policy that's then subject to this dampening down from the crowding out effect, it doesn't mean that the government policy is then contracting the economy. It's just not getting the one for one increase, right? It's like you spend um, 10, $10 billion, but you get something like, you know, right here, you get something like $8 billion worth of stimulus, right? That would be the idea. Uh, all right, the multiplier effect works in the other direction, and it corresponds to how government spending propagates and perpetuates a ripple effect throughout the economy. So this is going to lead to like government spending, then stimulating additional economic activity. So is the goal, and it's be like the situation where the government spends a dollar, and then a dollar forty worth of economic activity is generated. So this is like where there'd be a ten billion dollar. <laughs> Like 10 trillion, but $10 billion amount of stimulus or whatever would lead to $14 billion worth of like increase in GDP would be the idea. That would be the multiplier effect. Both are in operation at all times, the to some extent, the crowding out effect and the multiplier effect. And then it's sort of a tug of war between them in terms of like what ultimately happens and then how much stimulus you actually get from a given project expenditure. The investment demand curve slopes up to the right, or so, 
Sorry, the investment demand curve slows down to the right because lower real interest rates en enable more investment projects to be undertaken profitably, right? On the vertical axis, it's like the interest rate. Horizontal is like the amount of funds, uh, quantity of funds uh, demanded or the quantity of funds. And then at a lower interest rate, there's a larger quantity of funds that are demanded for investment because there's at the lower interest rate, you compare the interest rate that you're paying to the rate of return on the investment. And at lower interest rates, there's more investments with a rate of return that exceeds that interest rate. And it makes borrowing a good idea. So, right, profitability depends on the interest rate and the expected return on the investment. Falling interest rates make more uses of funds uh, make more use of funds likely to be profitable. Okay, so talking about money, the, the Fed defines money aggregates M1 and M2. Now, probably this hasn't been updated everywhere. So we think of historically M1 being checkable deposits, um, traveler's checks, and uh, currency in the hands of the non-bank public. As of December 2020, They've started counting savings deposits as part of M1. Uh, M1 is meant to be the most liquid forms of money, uh, checkable deposits, travelers, checks, savings now, and then cash in the hands of the non-banking public. Uh, coins and cash in the vaults of banks, not part of the money supply. Um, we think of this as, as uh, being swamped into the with, the with the banks holding back in terms of its reserves. Uh, okay, so a key tool in, oh, and then M2 is just like, M1 plus all the less liquid forms, like uh, less liquid forms of money. So it's just ways to kind of uh, keep track of the money supply. All right. Um, a key tool in monetary policy is open market operations. So this is where the, where the Fed is buying securities, usually treasury securities, could be other securities, but usually treasury securities. If the Fed buys bonds, that's bigger bucks. Look, B, B, buy bonds, bigger bucks. Right, Fed, the Fed buys bonds, that's gonna to lead to an increase in the money supply. So the money supply rises. If the Fed sells bonds, there's smaller bucks and the money supply falls, right? Sells bonds, SB, smaller bucks, right? And money supply falls. When the Fed buys bonds, what's happening is it's just like adding zeros to the ends of the bank accounts for member banks that have their reserves with the Fed. That's really what's happening. Uh, when the Fed buys bonds, it's depositing those funds into the accounts of the member banks, and they're able to make more loans, which expands the money supply. The Fed's buying bonds from the public, but then also primarily from banks. Um, so what ends up happening is the bank can now make more loans when the Fed buys bonds because the bank probably has excess reserves. Excess reserves means that it can safely make more loans. And in doing so, money is created. Money is created when the banks make additional loans. That's the expand. That's expansionary because it's going to increase aggregate demand by virtue of expanding consumption and investment. Now, if the Fed sells bonds, it's pulling funds from the accounts of member banks. It's reducing the balance, pulling zeros out of the balance of member banks, um, because it, when it sells bonds, it's selling them to the public, but primarily banks that have accounts with the Fed, selling it to the banks, and then it's pulling the funds in exchange for the securities that's just sold them from their account. So when this happens, uh, they're able to make fewer loans, which contracts the money supply. And in doing so, money is destroyed. When the bank recalls loans or makes fewer loans, then money is destroyed. That's contractionary because it's going to decrease aggregate demand by virtue of reducing consumption and investment. Right? So selling bonds shrinks the money supply, smaller bucks, raises the interest rate, and decreases economic activity. It's contractionary. Buying bonds, bigger bucks, increases the money supply, lowers the interest rate, and is expansionary in the sense of like it's going to stimulate aggregate demand to shift to the right. Another tool of monetary policy is the reserve requirement, which refers to the fraction of deposits the bank must retain rather than loan out. So there's a reserve requirement. If there's a reserve requirement of like $20, the, or 20%, $20. The reserve requirement of 20%, the bank must hold back $20 in every 100 deposited. So it can make $80 worth of loans. The reserve requirement is related to the monetary multiplier. Literally, the money multiplier is just the reciprocal of the reserve, require, or reserve requirement ratio. So higher reserve requirement ratio leads to a smaller money mu multiplier. Why? Because higher reserve ratio means you're holding back more of each deposit, making fewer loans, which means mo the money expansion process is going to be dampened down. Oh, I forgot to do this. Here's, stu here's puppy study break.
All right, here's the puppy study break. Here's the puppy. You can put in the comments, tell me about your puppy or your kitty or whatever, I don't know, whatever fish, snake, uh, ferret, whatever, <laughs> whatever uh, creature you've got. Um, or if you don't have a pet, whatever, um, then you could, I don't know, whatever. Just tell me what you had for breakfast or I don't know, whatever. So um, I don't I don't want people to be left out, I guess. Okay, so literally the money multiplier is just reciprocal of the reserve requirement ratio. Higher reserve re ratio leads to a smaller money multiplier. The last key tool of monetary policy is the discount rate, which is the interest rate banks must pay on funds borrowed directly from the Fed. So this is when they go to the discount window. There's some stigma associated with this. The question's like, well, why are you borrowing from the Fed and not from another bank, right? Um, usually the time when, fa when, when banks need to uh, borrow would be for, to, they've got the reserve requirement, right? And they've made out some loans and for whatever reason, they haven't, like they're in danger of not meeting their reserve requirement. They haven't got the loans, people haven't been paying back what they'd, exp or, I don't know, whatever. So they need to borrow funds to be able to meet the reserve requirement so they can borrow those funds from member banks. And that happens at the federal funds rate, which is the bank uh, the bank to bank uh, interest rate for short term, typically overnight loans. That's what's actually affected by open market operations is the federal funds rate. This is between banks. Now, if you can't get a loan from another bank, then you'd go to the Fed and you'd get a, a loan from them. And so now there's the question of like, why couldn't you get another bank to give you a loan? And so um, there's a little bit of stigma attached to this. During the Great Recession and the financial crisis, the Fed made a big point of saying that banks should be able to borrow directly from them without stigma, right? Fed's the lender of last resort. The other thing, so if you're in danger of not being able to meet your reserve requirement, the other thing you could do is you could just keep excess reserves so that that doesn't happen. You could kind of self-insure. That's actually really relevant for current modern U.S. monetary policy is having the Fed play with the federal funds rate. They can't set it exactly, but they have it kind of move around or they, they set the quantity at the trading desk in New York every day of, of funds available. And then the price adjusts, right? You could set quantity, let price adjust, or you could set price and let the quantity adjust. We don't want to set the price. We want to set the quantity and let, let the price adjust for a variety of reasons. Anyway, so, but the, what the Fed then does more directly is it plays along with the district uh, discount rate, which it sets directly, and that affects the incentive of borrowing from the Fed directly. And then it plays with the interest on excess reserves, which we haven't yet talked about, but that's the additional interest that, a Fed, that the Fed will pay to banks for keeping funds beyond what they're required to. And so this is like the self-insurance option. And so... It plays with those two interest rates and keeps the federal funds rate kind of um, as kind of the what what banks are encouraged to be looking to for their reserves, but the other two are relevant for guiding behavior. And then for um, that, that's kind of the way that the Fed uh, kind of indirectly influences the economy. Okay, so interest on excess reserves, I just mentioned what it was. That is kind of a new tool. It's like the fourth tool of monetary policy. I think it was enacted, I think, in December of 2008. So it was like in response to the financial crisis. It was on the, it was in the plans. They were planning on being able to use this tool and to start paying interest on excess reserves and then it became really necessary to do it. And so they got approval to be able to implement that a couple months sooner. So that's what ended up happening. Um, yeah, historically, the the Fed didn't pay interest on reserves, even, but um, so it's implicitly a tax. But um, more like in modern times, so to speak, the Fed pays interest on reserves and then on excess reserves. All right. So economists don't like using strong or weak to refer to currencies. So strengthen, weaken. We don't like using this for currencies because there's this sort of unfortunate implicit connotation that's a little bit misleading, right? It's misleading because it's not immediately true or immediately clear that a strong dollar or a weak dollar is good or bad. It depends where you are in the economy. If you are exporting goods, right? If you're exporting goods, you benefit from a from a weak dollar because your goods are now cheaper relative to your buyers. Um, if you're importing goods you're and you're buying from the other country, then you benefit from a strong dollar because you're able to buy more of the other good. If you're a tourist serving foreigners that are coming to our economy, you'd actually do better if there's a weaker dollar. But if you are abroad and you are a tourist in another economy, you're better if the dollar's strong. And so anyway, it kind of matters where you are in the economy as 
as to whether a strong or weak dollar is preferred. So instead, what we like to do is we like to talk about if the dollar is appreciating, meaning like its value is rising relative to some market basket of currencies, or depreciating, if the dollar value is falling relative to some market basket of currencies. It's always got to be relative to something else. So if the US dollar appreciates, this has to be relative to some other currency, like the euro. If the dollar appreciates relative to the euro, the euro must depreciate relative to the dollar. That's got to be reciprocals. We want to think of currencies as existing in a market with their own supply and demand. So when US consumers buy goods from Europe, they supply dollars, this increases supply of dollars, they demand euros, this increases demand for euros. When US consumers buy land in Canada, they supply dollars and then demand Canadian dollars. Um, to be able to buy the land in Canada, right? You have to kind of change your money and then be able to buy it in the local currency. Uh, if exchange rates are freely floating, they're impacted by market forces. If a currency appreciates, increases in value relative to a market basket of international currencies, we expect that country will be able to increase its imports because other, other things equal. The currency is appreciated. Its value has risen relative to international currencies. So now um, if... If the currency appreciates, you should be able to uh, buy more, like increase imports. That goes back to what I said initially, which is like you'd rather have your the dollar str uh, rather have the, the dollar have high value relative appreciate relative to the other country. If you want, if you are going to import, if you are going to be an importer of foreign goods, you'd be able to buy more of those foreign goods because those foreign produced goods are now relatively cheaper when your currency rises relative to theirs. Uh, and then lastly, for trade, the current account in a nation's balance of payments includes the balance of trade, goods and services imported and exported. Um, a deficit on the current account normally causes a surplus on the capital account. So you have like the, the account of goods and then you have the accounts of the money that's that's being exchanged. Um, and so that's kind of how this is, how this sort of relates. Okay, well, anyway, so this is kind of a quick walkthrough of the relevant... Uh, Relevant notes for review in a principles of macroeconomics class. So hope you found this useful. Hope you enjoyed the puppy study break and I'll see you next time.